We'll commence our service tonight by singing the hymn number seven. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life in atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Hymn number seven, and we shall stand as we sing this hymn together. Bow together in prayer. We come, our Heavenly Father, before thee this evening, and we thank thee that we are enabled, because of thy goodness and grace, to be found in thy house. We thank you, Lord, for all the benefits that thou hast showered upon us. We say with the psalmist, Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Thank you, Lord, that Thy mercies are new every morning, and we can say, Great is thy faithfulness. Lord, as we bow before thee, we know that we are nothing in comparison with God. We are a tiny speck, and thou art infinite. And we bless thee that God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And so, Lord, we who are nothing, bow before thee, thou who art the Almighty. And we rejoice, O God, that thou art able to help us. 
Thou canst help us in every time of sorrow, in every time of difficulty, in every time of need. And so we pray that thou wilt draw near in this service, open the windows of heaven, pour us out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive. Remember every individual that is here. Remember each one that is saved. Remember any who are not saved. We pray, Lord, for those who listen in online. Lord, we pray for uh, those who listen to the recordings uh, of the meetings. We ask, O Lord, that uh, the hand of God might be upon each one. Remember us. Remember those that are precious to us. Lord, they are a constant concern to our hearts. We want them to know thy touch. We want them to experience thy love and thy power. We want them to walk in the center of thy will and to bring honor to thy great name. O God, may it be so. We recognize too that as we have seen today already that we have failed on many occasions. Lord, that life is filled oftentimes with fear and yet thou dost deliver out of all the trials. And thou wilt yet deliver us uh, thy people uh, from every trial and every difficulty, every sorrow. Lord, thou wilt wash away our tears and we will be with Christ and we will be in that land where there's no sickness and no sorrow, no pain and no death. Help us, Lord, to go forward steadily and to go forward wholeheartedly. Help us, Lord, to resist the devil. Help us, O oh God, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We pray for this congregation, that it might be enriched by the hand of God upon it. Remember the Reverend Mercer and his wife and family. Remember, O oh God, the elders and the deacons of the congregation. Remember the membership and those who support the work. And we pray for the testimony of this congregation in this district. Lord, that it might be a vibrant testimony, a loving testimony, and a powerful witness. Look down, O God, from heaven above. We pray again for our nation, for a turning of the tide, a turning away from sin, and a turning to the Son of God, the one who is able to save and able to deliver. Hear this our cry, and be with us tonight. Remember those who cannot join with us. Keep thy loving hand upon them. We pray for multitudes in our land who are not saved. Lord, that uh, they might be arrested uh, by the word of God, suddenly uh, brought face to face with reality, and then suddenly brought to Christ. Hear this our cry, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Returning now to hymn number 409, O oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free. 409 will stand again as we sing.
scripture reading this evening is in the book of Acts chapter 16, the book of Acts chapter 16, and we're going to commence our reading at verse 25 of the chapter. Acts chapter 16, and commencing our reading at the 25th verse of the chapter. Acts 16 verse 25, and at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they speak unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart, and go in peace. But Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. And the sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them, and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. We'll end our reading there at the end of that 16th chapter of Acts. Trusting God will add his blessing to the reading of his own holy and inspired truth for Christ's sake. Amen. Uh, we're going to have the announcements and our brother, Mr. Howard McFarland, is going to come and make those announcements for us, please. just like to give everyone a very warm word of welcome again to our service tonight. It's good to see each one that is gathered with us. And a special word of welcome to the Reverend Porter, his wife and family. We're glad to have you along with us tonight as well. And anyone else is visiting, we give you a special word of welcome tonight. Those that have joined us online, whether it's at home or whether it's away on holiday, we trust that the Lord indeed will bless you wherever you are, wherever you listen, even to the service tonight. Special word of welcome to the Reverend Gordon Ferguson, again with us tonight. We enjoyed his ministry this morning. We trust that the Lord would even bless it to our hearts, continuing to bless that word, even as others listen to it, even in the future, and on CD or online. We trust that the Lord will bless that word to each one that has heard. And we trust that the Lord would even bless the Lord's servant tonight as he takes up the word of God and brings the word that the Lord has laid on his heart even for the service tonight. The meetings throughout the incoming week, Wednesday night, the prayer meeting at 8 o'clock, and Brother David Aiken will be responsible for the prayer meeting on Wednesday evening. Then next Lord's Day, the Reverend Ian Gulliher will be along, God willing, to take both the services, service at 12 noon and again at 7 p.m. on the next Sunday evening. We trust that the Lord indeed 
would even bless the Reverend Guller as he would come even with God's Word next week. And just a few things for to remember in prayer. Pray for the Children's Five Day Club, the outreach for that, and the as it takes place between the 1st and the 5th of August over at Gordview House. We trust that you would be in prayer for that, that as the Word of God would go forth to the boys and girls, that God would even speak to the hearts of the children. There's also the church barbecue over at Ecclesville Center in Fintna on Thursday the 18th of August. If you haven't put your name down for that, I trust you would even do that and the number coming along with you. The Lock Iron Fundamentalist Convention in Bethel Church uh, from Saturday the 30th of July to Sunday the 7th of August. And do keep those meetings in mind as well. As I said this morning, the Reverend Mercer is on holiday for two weeks. And if there is any visits needed or any sickness, do contact some of the elders and we will try and get something arranged for you. And also, we had made request for prayer this morning for James Hutchins Jr. We trust that you would continue to remember him. He is quite ill in hospital. And we trust that the Lord indeed would lay his hand upon James and that the Lord would be with even Linda and his family as well at this time. And also Lila Bingham in hospital as well. We trust that you would remember these folk in prayer. Thank you. I'd like to thank our brother Howard for the welcome here uh, to Oma. It's nice to be with you been a day of blunders as far as I'm concerned. I was getting the wrong uh, list of hymns this morning. And tonight I arrived here at 25 past six and uh, couldn't understand uh, why everybody was so late coming to the prayer meeting. It's the only church I know of that has an evening service at half past seven instead of at uh, seven o'clock or half past six or even as in the case of our Bally McGurney church uh, at six o'clock. And I was with Evelyn, and she must have wondered uh, why I left so early to come to church tonight. She never said anything, uh, so she let me walk into the trap of sitting here and wondering, uh, where is everybody? Do they not pray before uh, the evening service? But all is well uh, that ends well. And uh, we're going to turn to another hymn. We'll keep our seats for the first few verses. It's number 281, There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. 281, we'll keep our seats for the first three verses, and then we'll stand for the last two verses of the hymn.
standing for the last two verses. together briefly in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we pray now that thou wilt bless us as we turn to thy word. Fill me with thy Holy Spirit. Breathe out thy Spirit upon each one of us. May we hear what God is saying. May we respond. May we say, speak, Lord. Thy servant heareth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. My text is found in verses 30 and 31 of Acts chapter 16. Uh, We find here uh, the Apostle Paul in prison and the Philippian jailer comes to him and he he called for a light. He came in, he fell down before Paul and Silas and he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And their reply was, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. We believe that uh, this jailer was probably a Roman veteran. Uh, It was a reward often for an ex-soldier to be given custody uh, of prisoners, to be put in charge of a jail. So this man was probably a veteran, a very rough and a very hardened and tough man. Uh, He's converted, uh, we read of it in this chapter, and his conversion is very different from An earlier conversion that we have in the chapter, uh, the conversion of Lydia. Uh, That was very quiet. It was undramatic. His was dramatic. Hers was quiet. The Lord opened her heart and she attended unto the things that were spoken by Paul and his colleagues. Now, when we come to the heart of our text, we find the jailer posing a question. Sirs, what must I do? To be saved. And we have to ask why? Why did he ask this question? And also, what did he mean uh, by the question that he asked? Uh, we'll think firstly here of uh, why he asked the question. And we'll see that he asked the question because God was undoubtedly at work. Uh, now, you might say there was an earthquake, uh, that was God at work. And earthquakes are very frightening things. I remember uh, the Reverend Foster coming to Kilkeel speaking uh, at a young people's, I think it was a rally, and he described an earthquake. He had never experienced one, but he described it, and you would have thought that uh, it was happening. You could almost feel yourself moving uh, as he spoke of an experience that is extremely disorientating. Uh, then, of course, the late Reverend Wesley Graham and his wife experienced an earthquake out in Nepal. And our brother could describe what it was like trying to get out of that building, uh, watching earlier, uh, a few minutes earlier, as the people fled from the building, not realizing what was happening, and then suddenly uh, feeling the whole earth move. And you look and you see 
Uh, when the pictures that they sent out, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the road and it's all uh, on its side, everything has changed. Houses have been destroyed. Uh, people have lost their lives and many others have been seriously injured. Uh, an earthquake uh, is, we might say, it is an act of God. It's a very powerful uh, thing when it happens. But it doesn't necessarily lead people to get saved. Many have gone through earthquakes and they have not turned to the Lord. They may have turned to false religion. They may have turned further away from God. They may have turned to atheism. So an earthquake in and of itself doesn't turn people to God. But God is at work when there is an earthquake. And God was at work here in the life of this jailer. It's interesting, as you read the earlier section of the chapter, you see how God brought the Apostle Paul uh, to the city of Philippi, first place where he saw converts in Europe. God brought him to Europe. He wanted to go to Asia. The Holy Spirit forbade him to go there. And then he thought of going into the province of Bithynia, and the Spirit of God did not allow him to go there. He was perplexed, and then there came the vision in the night season, a man of Macedonia saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. So God had a purpose in bringing the Apostle Paul and Silas and their colleagues over to the city of Philippi. God had said to him, you can't go to Bithynia, you can't go to Asia, I want you to go to Macedonia, and I want you to go to the city of Philippi. He didn't tell him right away that he wanted him to go to the prison uh, and be in the prison in Philippi, but that was all part of God's plan. Doesn't it seem odd and strange? Here's the apostle, he comes to Philippi, the young damsel, uh, she follows him round until Paul is grieved and he commands the unclean spirit to come out of her and immediately her masters turned against him they hailed Paul and Silas before the magistrates. They ripped the clothes off their back and they beat them. And then they handed him over to the jailer and commanded him to keep him safely, to keep them safely. And he put their feet into wooden stocks. Not a very pleasant experience. So God says, you're not to go to Asia. You're not to go to Bithynia. You're to go to Europe. You're to go to Macedonia. You're to go to the city of Philippi. And I have a place for you there. It's a prison. And uh, I have a place for your feet in wooden stocks. How strange and how wonderful are the ways of God. Now Paul uh, was not disheartened by this. In the prison, along with Silas, at midnight, he prayed and they prayed and they sang praises unto God. And a very wonderful thing happened. Because it says the prisoners heard them. I find that interesting. You know what it would be like in a prison. Well, I suppose we've never been in one in that uh, context. But you know what it would be like. The rest of the prisoners are not like Paul and Silas. They're ungodly men. They have no time for God. They're there because of crime. And serious crime at that. And you'll not hear any singing from them. You'll not hear them praying. You might hear them cursing and swearing. And if they hear someone singing, and if they hear someone praying, their first reaction will normally be to tell them to shut up, especially as it's the midnight hour. But we want some peace. We don't want to hear you singing. We don't want to hear you praying to your God. But the Bible says the prisoners heard them. That suggests to me that a solemnity fell upon that prison. Before the earthquake, God was at work. He was silencing the other prisoners and they were listening. What strange noise is this? Here are people singing. They are singing about the Lord. Here are people praying and crying to God, praying for us, praying for the jailer, pleading for us, and they fell silent. God was at work in that prison in a very wonderful and remarkable way. And when God moves in a mighty way, 
he arrests the attention of men and women. During the 1859 revival, some services were held in churches in the town of Coleraine, and the churches were too small to hold the crowds. And so they moved uh, the meetings that were being held into the unfinished Coleraine Town Hall building. A doctor who was present at those meetings, and I think he was a saved man, he said the scene inside that town hall was like the scene he imagined it would be like on the day of judgment. People distressed, people crying to God, people pleading for mercy. Why? Because God was at work. And here is God at work. Why is this jailer asking, what must I do to be saved? Because God is at work in his life. And we could say uh, with the hymn, uh, Begone on Belief, Determined to save, he watched o'er my path when Satan's blind slave I sported with death. You see, God was determined to save the Philippian jailer. He was one of God's chosen ones. And I know that disturbs some people. They don't like it. They have a hostile attitude. How dare you speak about God choosing some and leaving others in their sins? How can you speak like that? They have a, what we call a dog in the manger attitude. You know, if you know that fable, that the dog sat upon a heap of grain. The horse wanted to eat the grain. The dog didn't want the grain, but it wouldn't allow the horse to touch the grain and satisfy its appetite. There are people like that with the gospel. Uh, they say, I don't like this talk about election. I don't like the thought of God choosing people. And then you say to them, well, would you like to be saved? Would you like to have your sins forgiven? Would you like to be a born-again Christian? And they will say to you, no, I have no interest in those things. Don't talk to me about uh, being born again. Don't talk to me about the cleansing of the blood of Christ. I have no interest, no interest whatsoever in those things. Don't talk about heaven and hell. This life's all there is. That's all I'm interested in. If I can make uh, some money, if I can have a happy life and uh, a successful life and have plenty of money to get me through this life and die without too much disturbance in uh, my death, uh, then I I'm happy. Yeah, you can keep your gospel. They don't want to be saved, but they also object to God saving other people. They have that, what I'm calling, a dog-in-the-manger attitude. But I come back to the jailer. The Lord was determined to save him. That's why he sent Paul uh, over to Europe and not to Asia or Bithynia. That's why he sent him into that jail. That's why he sent the earthquake. And uh, that's why the jailer was here uh, kneeling down before, before Paul and Silas and saying, Sirs, treating them now with respect, where he had no respect for them previously, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? A miracle, a miracle has taken place. And it's always miraculous when someone is saved. I mentioned Lydia. When Lydia got saved, that was a miracle. The Lord opened her heart. You and I can't open a person's heart. Paul and Silas couldn't open her heart. The Lord opened her heart. And the smallest child in the Sunday school that gets saved in the Sunday school or in a children's meeting or led to Christ by a father or mother, it's a miracle that takes place when any person is saved from sin because that person is given a new nature, set on a new road, a road that will terminate in glory with that person rejoicing eternally in Jesus Christ. But I want to come to a second reason why this jailer asked this question, what must I do to be saved? And I will say it to you because Paul and Silas uh, were praying for them and uh, or praying for him and witnessing, uh, had been witnessing to him, and they cared 
for his soul. I think I can prove all three points. I don't have to prove that they prayed, for it's in the passage. Uh, at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. They were praying, especially for their fellow prisoners, and maybe we might say even more especially for the jailer. He had been very rough and very unkind to them. He had shown no regard for these two men who had done him no wrong. The Bible says he thrust them or he threw them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. He had no regard for them. They were troublemakers and uh, they followed a religion that he had no time for, but they cared for him. They prayed for him. And I'm saying that they witnessed to him. And you say, how do you prove that? Well, notice the question that he asked, and you'll see it. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And from uh, the answer that was given, he was talking about being saved from sin and being right with God and being made ready for heaven. Well, how did he know anything about being saved? A man uh, who grew up, we might say, and practiced, if he practiced any religion, a heathen religion, a veteran, a man who has faced death and a great danger and great fear on the battlefield and triumphed and come back home safe and sound. What did he know about being saved? And yet... He asks this question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So, where did he learn that? I have no doubt whatsoever that Paul and Silas witnessed to him when uh, he arrested them, or no, he didn't arrest them, but when uh, he laid hold of them, and all the time he was fastening those wooden stocks uh, on their feet, they were telling him, Perhaps Paul was witnessing about his conversion on the Damascus Road. And Silas was adding what he could say and speaking about Christ, the Son of God, speaking about his coming into this world, that he was born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he performed mighty miracles, that he died in the place of sinners and died voluntarily in the place of sinners. And then they kept it all by speaking of the resurrection. He rose again. He's alive. And they both could say, he saved me. He saved me. He rescued me from my sins. And that's where this jailer learnt this word saved. What must I do to be saved? He learnt it because... They had been testifying to him and preaching all the time that uh, he was putting them into that prison and making their feet fast in the stocks. And then we know how much they cared for him. When the jailer discovered uh, what the earthquake had done in opening all the prison doors and loosening uh, the uh, bonds that were on the prisoners, he knew he was going to be disgraced and he couldn't face it. Isn't it strange? that a man who could face the gravest of dangers on the battlefield couldn't face the disgrace of allowing a few prisoners to escape from his prison. And he drew out his sword. He was seconds away from taking his life when he heard this urgent and instant cry, this loud cry from the inner prison. It was Paul. And Paul cries out to him and he says, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Why did Paul say that? Because Paul cared for that man. He didn't say, well, that man was very rough. And that man, perhaps as uh, he was doing it, was cursing them and blaspheming. It wouldn't be an, have been an unusual thing for him to act like that or speak like that. But all the time, Paul's heart was melting. And he thought of that man. And he thought of that man dying. He thought of that man in hell, lifting up his eyes in hell, being in torments. And by the perception that God gave to Paul, he knew what was taking place, even though he couldn't see what was taking place. He knew the man was going to kill himself. 
and commit suicide. And so he cried out, do thyself no harm. I don't want you to die this way. I want you to be rescued. I want you to be saved from your sins. So I say that he's asking the question because Paul and Silas prayed for him and witnessed to him and cared for his immortal soul. And isn't that a lesson to you and me if we're saved? That we should pray for those who are not saved? That we should witness to them? You say, perhaps I'm no good at speaking. Well, you're not so helpless you can't hand out a gospel tract and invite people even to a meeting. Not so helpless that uh, we uh, can't have a burden for the lost and with tears in our eyes and brokenness of heart plead for them that God would have mercy upon them and rescue them from their sins. But but I, I want to go to another point here. And... Uh, I want to say that the jailer almost didn't get saved. Uh, We find him on the brink of hell, on the very brink of hell. Uh, I've mentioned what happened as the prison doors flew open and all the bonds were loosed from the prisoners. He knew then he was going to be disgraced for the first time ever. Prisoners uh, would have escaped from under his watch and custody. And so he drew out his sword. Give him a few seconds more. And that man will not be bound for heaven. He will be in the presence of God. He'll be condemned. He'll be cast into hell. And uh, it's an amazing thing. God intended to save him. God was determined to save him. But it seems almost as if he's determined not to be saved. And I think the crucial thing was when Paul spoke up and cried to him and said, Do thyself no harm. And the the Lord gripped his soul. And then he came and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? A person that God has determined to save may run very close to hell. Uh, You've often heard, I'm sure, of the sword of Damocles. It's a sword hanging in the air, suspended by a thread. This man, he wanted... He wanted to be uh, the prime guest, the uh, the most important person at the feast, and it was conceded to him, but the sword, suspended by a thread, hung over his head. And at any moment, it might have fallen and brought about his death. Well, this man was in an equally perilous position. He was about to die. He was about to plunge into hell. And I've read of others, and I'm sure uh, some of you have done the same. Uh, Someone on their way to commit suicide, uh, and uh, they pass by uh, a church building or a mission hall, and they hear some singing. And before they do the deed, uh, they're attracted by the singing. And they go into that mission hall or that church building, and they hear the gospel, and it grips their heart, They realize that there is hope, that they can have peace with God, that they can be saved from their sins, that they can be set on the road to heaven. And they cry to God, and God steps in, and God saves their precious, never-dying soul. So I just throw that point in. The jailer almost didn't get saved. God was determined to save him, but he was determined not to be saved. Who won? It was God who brought about the change. And the man cried out, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, I want to go to another point. I want to say that when God is at work, he gives those who ask a question like this very clear instructions. It says, They told him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, And thou shalt be saved and thy house. That is very, very clear. They don't tell him, look, you have to do some good works. You have to be baptized. You have to sit at the communion table. Uh, You have to read your Bible every day. Uh, You have to pray three times a day. Uh, You have to stop being dishonest. You have to stop being rough. No, uh, that would be salvation 
by his own efforts, by his own good works. And what does the Bible say? It says, by grace are you saved through faith, and not that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's something that's free. It's not something we achieve. It's not something we earn. And then it adds, not of works. I think it's wonderful how people have twisted that. So many people, if you ask them, are you hoping to get to heaven? Do you think you'll be there? And they will say, well, I'm not a bad person. Uh, I'm honest and I'm respectable. And my neighbors will tell you all of that. And I go to church and I pay into the church and I pray and I read it. The Bible may not read avidly, but I read the Bible. I never do anybody uh, an ill turn. Uh, I'm a respectable citizen. And what are they saying to you when they tell you that? They're saying, I hope by my good works to get to heaven. And I grew up believing that. I remember as a boy thinking, uh, uh, my good deeds have to outweigh my evil deeds if I'm to get into heaven. And, and I was troubled about it. Uh, and uh, I remember lying in bed at night and uh, I, I knew I wasn't right. And I thought, when the morning comes, I'm going to start reading my Bible and uh, living in a different way. And it was just a boy at the time. But when morning came, the fears disappeared and I didn't read the Bible. But that was the way I thought you got to heaven. Your good deeds outweighing your evil deeds. That's works. And Ephesians 2 and verse 9 says, It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And here's Paul and Silas. They, they don't tell the man that uh, good works will save him. They say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And, and later on, we find them opening up and explaining the word of God. He may have had some questions when he brought them into his home and wanted to have it all clearly explained. Who is Jesus Christ? I heard you say something uh, when I was throwing you into the prison, but I want to hear more. And they told him about Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Savior, the only Savior, and willing to save, able to save, uh, repeating perhaps about the resurrection, about his death, about his blood shedding, and so on until the man was thoroughly convinced. But the thing he needed to do, and this is the clearance of instructions, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not enough for us to explain it all to you and tell you who Jesus is and what he has done, how willing he is to save you. You've got to put your trust in him. Think of an Old Testament illustration. Think of the ark that Noah built. It was a structure that was perfectly adapted and perfectly constructed to save those inside from a flood that would last for over a year. And you could have examined it. You could have said the wood's the right kind of wood. It's pitched within and without with pitch, and that seals it. And when everybody's in, the door will be closed, and God will close that door, and... If you're inside that ark, if you're inside that ark, you'll not perish in the flood. If you're outside that ark, you will. Now, that would have been no good to a person who admired it and said, it looks great. I, I, I do believe that, that that is waterproof. I believe that uh, according to the instructions given by God, it has been constructed. Everything is in order. Everything's in order. And there's the man or woman standing outside admiring. And Noah might say, why don't you come in? The door is still open. And they say, no, I don't want to go in. I, I'm not convinced there'll be a flood. If there ever should be a flood, there'd be the perfect place to be. But I don't want to go in. I want to enjoy my life here. And they stay out. Yes, they can see the ark is suitable, but they don't put their trust in it by entering into it. And may, many people will look at Christ and say, yes, I believe that he's able to save. I believe that he's able to deliver from sin. But they never come to him. They never come 
They never call upon his name. They never truly put their trust in him. Maybe there's someone here, and that is your situation. You hear the exhortation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. And it's not just a short-term salvation. It's eternal salvation. Come to him. And yet, you stay outside. You admire from a distance. That'll never get you to heaven. If you want to be saved, you've got to put your trust in Jesus Christ. One final thought. When God saves a person, he saves that person completely. The jailer was saved and he was changed completely. It's as if he wasn't the same man. A rough, swearing man, an irreligious, blaspheming man as we picture him. Any religion was a worship of false gods and superstition. And now he hears that salvation is found in the person of Jesus Christ and that Christ is willing and able to save him. He puts his trust in him. And what a change. Before he throws Paul into the prison, makes his feet fast in the stocks. Now, humbly, he, the, the, the man in charge of the jail, Paul and Silas have been prisoners in that jail, and he washes their stripes. He, he's condescending from arrogance to humility. A changed man, a different man altogether. And he gets some food, and he places the food before them so that they may have a substantial meal. I dare say prison food was absolutely horrible food. Horrible. Virtually inedible. But now they're getting good food. The best in the house. He wants to be baptized to acknowledge that Christ is his saviour. And then we find him doing something in verse 34 that he rejoiced. He rejoiced. Rejoiced with all his family. That's a wonderful thing. Perhaps that man hadn't smiled in years. Any smile previous to this time for many years would have been a bitter smile. Oh, you're suffering. I'm glad to see you suffering. You're a criminal. I'm glad to see you punished. I'll make it as hard as possible for you. And if you die in my prison, that's too bad. A grim smile. But now, he's so changed. He's rejoicing. And he's not rejoicing simply in himself and his family. He's rejoicing in the Lord. And so great has been the blessing that all his family are also rejoicing. Rejoicing in the Lord with all his house, with all his family Glad in the Lord. Isn't he a different man? Isn't he a different man? And isn't that what the Bible tells us? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And if anyone had met that man the next day, they'd have said, what's happened to that jailer? He's, a, he's the same in appearance in some ways, although even his countenance has changed. Uh, my, uh, the frown is gone. Uh, the scowl has gone. The hatred is gone from his face. And there's a meekness and a gentleness. And, and there's a loving expression on his face. He seems to be serenely happy and contented. He's changed. And may I say this to you? If you profess to be saved... And you live like the world and like the devil and carry on as you carried on before you were saved. Well, you weren't saved. You know, you're not changed. Uh, the, the, the Bible makes it very clear that when you're saved, you're different. You can't carry on sinning. Uh, that the way you sinned uh, in your unsaved days... Paul asked the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he added these words, God forbid. God forbid. Here is a man who's changed. A man and his family changed. This story, and it's not a fable, this story 
took place was written 2,000 years ago. And for the last roughly 2,000 years, the Philippian jailer and his wife and his family have been in heaven. What a glorious thing that is. Before they went to heaven, they were part of the church in Philippi, one of the best churches recorded in the New Testament. And can you picture the jailer and Lydia, the man who's been a rough man and she a gentle lady, and they're joined together. They're joined together in the prayer meeting. They're joined together on the Sabbath, singing God's praises, listening to the preaching and exposition of God's word. And then when they all have run their earthly course, they're joined together in glory. But I ask you, what about you? What about your soul? If you die, where will you be in eternity? The Lord Jesus Christ gives us this glorious invitation. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He'll save. And the hymn writer said, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. doesn't matter how deeply we have sinned, how much shame and disgrace we've brought on ourselves. If we put our trust in Christ and come to him confessing our sins, the Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I trust God will bless his truth to our hearts. We're going to sing a couple of verses of our final hymn, 278, Vile and sinful though my heart may be, fully trusting, Lord, I come to thee. Thou hast parted, cleanse, and make me free. I am coming home. Uh, so we'll sing verses 1 and 4. Verses 1 and 4. I know that presents a difficulty for whoever's operating uh, the words on the screen, but we'll sing just verses 1 and 4, and we'll stand as we sing. the music. Uh, I think I put you off. Verse 4. We'll get it right. Uh, if at first you don't succeed, uh, try again. Verse 4. get that right sometime but don't forget the importance of uh, this wonderful text of scripture what must I do to be saved believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house father in heaven we pray that thou wilt apply thy truth to our hearts guide us direct us may we hear thy voice and may we respond separate us now in thy fear and with thy love and blessing, spread thy covering wings around 
till all our wandering cease, and at our Father's loved abode, thy saints arrive in peace. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.